Who needs a preamble anyways, you know what I mean? I felt like talking about the cars today, so that's what I'm gonna do, among some other things. So if you're sitting comfortably, let's begin, shall we? Listening to the John Huff Podcast. Oh, yeah. Oh, 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 oh. I received just a beautiful compliment on the weekend. So we trundled down to the Chatham region to play the first of two Fresh Breath EP release shows, right? I've been talking about this for a while. Haven't been able to play for quite some time, kids, and so we've been working on these tunes. Fresh Breath, friends of ours, hired Ken the Zen and I to be the rhythm section for these EP release shows. The EP, How Did I Get Here, really, really a wonderful little record. And it was our privilege, it still is our privilege and our honor, to play those shows. And we've been working these songs up for quite a while. Finally got the chance to get on stage and play him. And it was really terrific, man. It was last Saturday night. And so after the show, you know, I'm doing the runaround. Going up to the stage, getting stuff I need, sitting in the green room, you know, talking to people, whatever, doing the thing. And so I go up the stage to get something. <laughs> Can't remember what, but I went up the stage for whatever reason. And this is at a venue called Barn on the Farm, okay? Fresh Breath actually owns this space. This is their space. And they have a rural property and they have this barn, a small barn that they converted to just a really, really nice venue. It's got a stage and it's got the lights and the sound. And we had things set up socially distanced. You know, none of that, none of that. And so it was just a really beautiful evening and a beautiful space. And so there's property around it, so you can be in the barn, you know, both ends open. You can be in the barn and see the show, or you can sit just outside the barn around the fire pit with your chairs, and you can still hear the show, but you're outside, you know, all very COVID-friendly. And so I'm walking out of the barn towards where the green room area is with whatever it was I went to get, and all of a sudden, I find in front of me on the lawn, a lovely woman. <laughs> this lovely woman who's suddenly standing in front of me and she says, Hey, great drumming tonight. Thank you. She says, You didn't drown out my daughter. Whoa. This was Katie Pascoe's mom, Katie of Fresh Breath, saying... You did great. You didn't drown out my daughter. Now, you got to understand, for me, what a beautiful compliment that is. All right? Because my game as a side player is to be supportive of the music, is to play the songs in a complimentary way that provides a platform rhythmically for the rest of the band, but ultimately provides a foundation upon which the true stars of the show, that's Katie and Josh, can be their best. And I inferred from this compliment that there have been times when the band has played and maybe the supporting cast has been just a little bit too loud, just a little bit insensitive to how they're sitting in the mix, this kind of thing. It's very, very tough. Okay, I'll be honest about this. It's very, very tough when you're on stage to know what it sounds like out in front of the stage. And especially if you don't have a dedicated sound person, which we didn't. Brett, the guitar player, was handling sound for the event. If you don't have somebody out front who's really controlling the volumes, you know, of the things that are mic'd up or the things that are running through the mains or the things that are running through the house, it's really, really tough to know if you're too loud, if you're not loud enough, where you're sitting. And it takes a certain amount of experience and sensitivity to this potential <laughs> to
to be able to kind of run it from where you're sitting. And as a drummer in particular, you don't have a volume knob that you can turn up and down, right? You have to do this with your body. You have to do this with your hands, with your foot, with your sticks. And for somebody like me, who lives in this bizarre drumming world and feels at times really self-conscious about the fact that I'm not a busier player, not a flashier player, not super interested in the pyrotechnical stuff. You know, it's rewarding when somebody acknowledges your kind of approach and philosophy. There's a professionalism to not drowning out the singer who's trying to sing these songs, especially kind of folk-driven rock songs alt-country songs like Fresh Breath Plays. This is not a big rock show. Therefore, does not require big rock volume, all right? So what I bring to the game is a sensitivity to this kind of stage volume that I've had to learn over time, by the way. And I bring a simplicity of approach. And sometimes in the world of Instadrummers and the internet, where everything seems to be about flash and licks and technicality and how fast can you play and how many freaking notes can you cram in here, how much attention can you draw to yourself with the intricacy of your playing, somebody like me feels lost and inadequate sometimes in those scenarios. Even though you know on a logical level, even though you know on a professional level, even though you know on an experiential level, that to bust out that 30-second note lick <laughs> at the end of a folk song is probably going to get you fired. You know this on an intellectual level. But the more you spend time kind of in the social media world being bombarded with this busy, 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 hot licks, hot licks, hot licks philosophy that's just not your game, the more you're inundated with this, the more you kind of fall victim to it. I've said before that what you focus on becomes your reality, man. And if all that you see going past your screen is the next insane double bass lick or odd time thing or metric modulation, whatever that is, you know, you become overwhelmed by the sense of you need to be a much flashier, busier player. And that's not my game. My game is simplicity. My game is holding down the beat. My game is supporting the song. My game is sensitivity to volumes. And so when you have somebody come along after a show who says, you did great, you didn't drown out my daughter, it warms your cockles, man. It reaffirms for you that what you're doing is working and it's okay. And I'm getting better at being a kind of anti-drummer. <laughs> An anti-drummer who's not into all the hot flash jelly roll stuff, man. And it's okay. And in fact, it's good. And it's probably best. I don't want to say best. Best is not the right word to use. Because sometimes hot flash jelly roll is exactly what the song needs. And if you're into a style of music that rewards busy and technical and intricate playing, prog stuff or some, something like that, then that's perfect, and you're the guy for that job. I'm not the guy for that job. I'm the guy for singer-songwriters who want somebody to play simply, with a bit of style, with a bit of nuance, and a lot of dynamics. These are the things that I'm learning to do better because they seem to be the things that I can do. And so it warms my cockles when somebody comes along and said, hey, you didn't drown my daughter. Because <laughs> that means that what I'm trying to do, I seem to do successfully. And I'm getting more comfortable and more confident with being the anti-drummer. Anti-drummer in a sense of I'm the opposite of what seems to be hot right now. I'm the opposite of what seems to be valued. Even though I know intellectually that's not really what's valued. The sort of drumming as an Olympic sport. <laughs> the competition drumming, you know what I mean? That's not really what it's ever been. I don't think. Maybe it has. Maybe there was points in jazz where that kind of thing really flew. Like, what do you get with Buddy Rich? 
Everybody worships Buddy Rich, and for good reason, all right? Trailblazer, legend. Guy went head-to-head with Animal. And, but all you ever see, you go and see, here's Buddy Rich, and he's playing this big band song, and it's just notes. (laughs) And then it's a drum solo in the middle of it all, which is notes. So there has been a point in time where this this has kind of been the game. But for me, as, you know, increasingly a singer-songwriter guy and an alt-country kind of guy and maybe a little bit of a pop kind of guy, that's not really my game. And it doesn't seem as though there are a lot of people out there who present that game as the game to play, you know? Because maybe it doesn't get a lot of clicks. Maybe it doesn't get a lot of views. Me playing a simple two and four at 102 beats per minute Not really all that exciting to look at or listen to, I guess. But that's the point. You're not supposed to be listening to me. You're supposed to be listening to the people up front, the band, the song. And what I'm providing, hopefully, is making that experience more enjoyable. Making the beat feel good to you. Maybe making you dance. So that felt really good. And I I am grateful for that compliment. And it is very affirming for me. And it's timely, you know, because the great Charlie Watts passed away last week. And I say there's not a lot of people out there presenting the simple approach, you know, as the way to go. But one guy who was and who became a freaking legend for it is Charlie Watts, man. If you caught Wine Friday on Instagram last week, I talked with a degree of passion about how Charlie Watts influenced me as a player, or at least provided what I've heard called an allowing. Sometimes you're in a position where you feel like what you're doing, what you're trying to do, isn't right or isn't accepted. In my case, being a very simple, basic drummer. It's not okay. You've got to be this and this and this. You've got to be flashy and you've got to run the double kick. Got to play those 64th notes, man. That's where it's at. And then if you're me and you don't really want to do that, sometimes you need somebody who provides an allowing. And that's people like Charlie Watts, who spent 50 years on the drum throne of arguably the biggest band of all time, playing, for the most part, two and four, all right? A little bit of style, a little bit of nuance couple little licks here and there, but for the most part, two and four. And he did that for decades. And he did it great. And there are people who look at that and recognize a legend, all right? Ditto Ringo Starr. And, but there's also a group of people who annoy me who will see a tribute to Charlie Watts, who just passed away, and feel as though they need to hip everyone to the fact that Charlie wasn't, you know, he was a very basic drummer. You read this in the YouTube comments. Don't read the comments on anything. (laughs) Why can I not learn this lesson? They'll say, Charlie Watts, a very basic drummer, man, very simple. And they'll, you know, dismiss that as being in some way not okay. (laughs) In some way not good. Like, why are we celebrating this guy? He was very simple. He's no, he's no Mike Portnoy, man. Or whatever, you know, whatever really technical drummer is out there. But we don't know what Charlie Watts had for the most part. This dude was a jazz cat, all right? Jazz cats have hands, man. But those hands don't belong in Rolling Stones songs. And it annoys me when I see somebody who provides the kind of rhythmic foundation that Charlie provided, who provides the kind of simplicity but groove that Ringo provided, and these sort of Self-styled commentators come along and turn up their nose and say, well, he, was, he, he wasn't that great, man. He was just very simple. Like, come on. Like, good drumming is about playing 64th notes. <laughs> good drumming is about as busy as you can possibly be. Good drumming is about being as in the way as you can possibly be on this song, drawing attention to yourself. Well, it's not, man. Good pop drumming is about your butt wiggling, all right? Good pot drumming is about those ladies in the front row dancing the night away. So go away with your Charlie Watts wasn't that good. 
Go away with your own. Give me a break. Anybody can play what Ringo played. They can't. They can't play it like Ringo, all right? And you can stuff it in a sack, mister. It bothers me. And so my hat is tipped to freaking Charlie Watts, all right? Because that dude provided an allowing for people like me who come along and say, I want to play two and four. I want to play simple. I want this groove to breathe. I want this song to breathe. And I don't need attention drawn to myself on this. I just want to play simple and enjoy it and not feel this pressure to be a drummer that's in the way and busy and loud and showing off all of his flashy freaking licks. Because there is a pressure to be that thanks to the Insta world and the online world that rewards that kind of spectacle. It's what gets clicks, man. And I'm not saying those players aren't good. Those players are freaking amazing. <laughs> but when those players get all of the attention at the expense of actual playing songs with groove and feel and emotion and evocation, that makes people dance. That's a problem for me, and it bothers me. So my hat is tipped to Charlie Watts, because you look at Charlie, or you look at Charlie Hall from The War on Drugs, my sort of modern equivalent, and people like Jason Tate, they, they can do the stuff. They don't. They play the songs. And sometimes you feel like playing the songs isn't good enough, but it is. People like Charlie Watts provide the allowing. You say, well, I can't do that 64th note lick because I've never practiced it because I'm not interested. It's cool, but I'm not interested. Can't really use it anywhere for what I'm doing. And you feel bad about that. You, you know, you feel bad about yourself and you feel bad about that. Then you look at Charlie Watts. You look at Charlie playing legendary Stones tunes and you say, well, you know what? It was good enough for Charlie. And if it's good enough for Charlie, it's freaking good enough for me, man. And I would like to own Charlie's drum set. <laughs> Charlie played the same freaking Gretsch drum kit for years. He's got symbols around that kit where he doesn't even know where they came from. He doesn't know what they are. You know, logos are long rubbed off if they ever had them. The same kit because he liked it. Charlie Watts could have any gear from any company on planet Earth for free. Because he's Charlie Watts of the Rolling Stones. And you know what? Played the same dang Gretsch kit. Played the no-name symbols that he didn't even know what they were because he liked them. And that was good enough for him. Didn't need more than that. Didn't need to play more than that. Didn't need to have more than that. Didn't, you know, need the attention. Let Keith and Mick have all the attention. And I respect that, man. So big up, Charlie Watts. Thank you for providing and allowing for people like me who just want to play songs, all right? And, you know, I feel like I'm beginning to do that successfully when someone comes along and says, you didn't drown my daughter tonight. <laughs> so thank you, Katie's mom, for that. But, you know, we are driving home. Ken, the Zen, and I, man, we haven't had a chance. You know, I haven't been driving home at 2.30 in the morning from a gig with Ken, the Zen in way too long, man. Like, probably close to two years. And it just felt good to be doing that again. Hurts in the morning, not gonna lie to you. But it feels good to just be back having that experience again. It almost feels like real life. We were driving home, and as is wont to happen, Ken the Zen and I are talking about the music. And we were playing Sarah Harmer on the way home. We played Crunchy all the way down. Crunchy is my boy Monty from Galactic Cowboys. His solo records, he released three of them under the name Crunchy. And if you are into super duper upbeat Foo Fighters, Wild Hearts kind of rock and roll with just layers and layers of vocal harmonies, go listen to the Crunchy stuff. It crushes, it's heavy, it rocks, but it's also kind of pop, punk kind of thing with these great harmonies, really great stuff. And we listened to that all the way down. On the way home, I needed something just a little more gentle, man. So we put on the Sarah Harmer, and, I, you know, that always does it for me. Still the dream, Sarah. Give me a call. And so we're driving home, and we get to talking about the cars, which we do from time to time. 
because we both love the cars. And when we do our cover band thing, the three, we play some cars, man. And it always gets people out of their seats, gets them jumping. You know, we play a few songs and they're not really feeling it. We jump into Best Friends Girl and the place is a hopping, man. Something about the cars. But, you know, there's a there's a phenomenon with the cars that kind of blows me away. Because they're one of those bands that when you begin to listen to their catalog, you're like, holy cow, man. How many freaking giant hits did this band have? The cars are a band like that. because. I once listened to their greatest hits, you know, this is, I don't know, four or five years ago. And there was a, either an actual record or a YouTube playlist kind of thing, which was the car's greatest hits. And there were like 15 or 20 songs on it. And just one after the other, these massive songs began to roll out. Like just an endless run. I was like, that was the cars, that was the cars, that was the cars. I forgot that song. That was the freaking Cars. I forgot that song, too. That was huge. Just this endless run of huge singles. And they kind of get forgotten. Like, you don't even realize you know as much Cars as you do. The Canadian equivalent of that, by the way, is Sloan. (laughs) I was once on a festival playing with Carly Thomas, and we quote-unquote opened for Sloan. (laughs) Which means we were on a couple of acts before Sloan on this stage, on this festival. So yeah, we opened for Sloan. And I got to sort of be around Sloan backstage, which was kind of fun. Anyways, they went up, and they played for an hour and a half, and every freaking song they played was a radio hit. (laughs) And it had the same effect. It's like, that song, that song, that song, I forgot that song, that was Sloan, that was Sloan, that was Sloan. It just went on and on and on and on. And you don't even think about it. You think, yeah, I, I, like, I like Sloan, they're kind of cool. But then you dig in, do a little bit of a deeper dive, and you're like, holy cow, it was endless. Same deal as the cars, man. And so I was kind of looking into the cars a little bit more because we were talking about it. And as I'm reading about the cars, this term new wave keeps popping up. The cars were a new wave band from the late 70s in America. And I thought, We hear that term, but what is New Wave, really? You know, I hadn't looked into the history. And I'm beginning, you know, if you've been following the last few shows, beginning to dig a little bit into the music history. Now, I bring this with a caveat. All of these are fairly superficial histories, okay? I don't have the time to do super-duper deep dives (laughs) on these topics, all right? And, you know, in a podcast episode, you can't do the whole history of punk music well. I don't think. Maybe you can. Maybe you can, because punk was not a long-lasting thing, like the real punk phenomenon. And I mention that because when you approach and consider this concept of new wave music, you find its roots in the punk phenomenon, all right? So you've got to dig a little bit back in time. New wave stuff is like late 70s into the early 80s, but the roots of it go directly back to punk rock, the real punk rock phenomenon, like 74 to 78, 79, all right? So what is punk music, okay? Punk music was anti-establishment music in the 70s, all right? And what is the establishment in the 1970s? What is the musical establishment? So punk rock looks around and they see big, huge, popular stadium rock bands, right? You got the Stones, you got Zeppelin, you got these big bands that are playing huge rooms. And what does it mean when you're headlining stadiums? What does it mean when you're drawing 40,000 people to your shows? Well, it means you've achieved mainstream acceptance, man. And what's the worst thing you can be to the punk people? Mainstream accepted, right? So they're looking at these bands, not just as bands, but bands representing a culture. Bands representing an acceptance, right? So they're looking at whatever the Stones are doing and whatever Led Zeppelin's doing, And they're saying, this represents the establishment, and it's not okay, all right? So this kind of, 
not exactly vapid, but just a little bit kind of not saying anything corporate rock. The Rolling Stones, right? You know, they're looking at that and saying, whatever that is, it's accepted by the masses and therefore we don't like it. And then they're looking to the right and they're seeing all this prog music happening. All of this virtuosity and noodling and self-indulgence and these songs that go on forever and become complicated for the sake of being complicated. Complexity for the sake of complexity. Not delivering much except wankery. Very much self-indulgent. Kind of shoegazing kind of stuff. Very looking inward, you know? This prog rock that's so full of itself. And then they're looking over at the radio charts at what's supposed to be rock and roll. And there's a great quote from a cat called John Holmstrom, all right? John Holmstrom was the editor, maybe still is, I don't know, of Punk Magazine. So they go to that guy who's got his ear to the punk underground. And they're like, where did this come from? And he's like, look. We're rock and rollers, and we look up at what's called rock and roll these days, and it's Billy Joel, and it's Simon and Garfunkel, and they're like, this is not rock and roll. Rock and roll is about rebellion, man. Rock and roll is about youth culture. It's about rebellion. And there ain't nothing in Simon and Garfunkel that we can shake a fist at, man. So we don't like this arena rock that everybody's accepted and is so corporate. And we don't like the prog rock that's over there, which is all wankery and noodling and self-indulgent. And we don't like this weak stuff that's posing as rock and roll. And we don't like the failure of the hippie dream. (laughs) At least for the American punk bands. They're looking back a few years earlier at Woodstock and the Summer of Love and this whole hippie thing about peace and love and community, and coming together, and this sort of, you know, rose-tinted view of the world. The punks are looking around, it's the 70s, and they're like, that's a failed dream, man. This is bogus, all right? That culture failed. Because look at us in the 70s. You know, things are a freaking mess. Life is hard. Especially in Britain, where the real punk thing started, all right? Over in Britain, 1970s, life ain't so rosy. Especially for your blue-collar kids, man. Living in these streets, unemployment is high, things are expensive, the outlook is kind of bleak, man. And then all of a sudden, these bands begin to emerge out of this sense of dissatisfaction. And what they do is they go after, you know, the sacred cows. So you get the Sex Pistols singing God Save the Queen and Anarchy in the UK, going after the monarchy, going after the institutions, going after the lie of progress, I suppose. A progress rooted in an old, old system, like a caste system in England, right? You got these disaffected kids looking around saying, the mainstream sucks. The mainstream has landed us here. (laughs) unemployed, poor, we're angry, we're upset about this. You know, we're not going to buy the lie anymore. We like the Sex Pistols because they see what we're talking about. And they're here to F up the mainstream, man. And so this punk culture comes along, which is all about shock and outrage. God save the queen, anarchy in the UK, right? And you got kids wearing safety pins and they got mohawks and they got t-shirts on that are designed to be crass and vulgar and to shock people. This is music and a lifestyle culture designed to make people angry, designed to shake the foundations, right? And the kids gravitate to it like freaking crazy because here's a chance to express this anger that we feel. And, you know, Teenage Rebellion, they were rebelling with Elvis, all right? Kids just like to do that. (laughs) Even if there aren't social political undertones to it. Even the rich kids like to rebel, you know? So this punk thing begins to really freaking take off. And like all movements, it kind of hits a crest and begins to drop off. You know, punk's whole thing was very short. 
we're talking about like 74 to 78. And that was two waves. The first wave from 74 to 76, the kind of classic punk rock bands that we know about. And then 76 to 78, things already are beginning to morph. We're getting into things like hardcore and a narco punk. <laughs> A-N-A-R-C-H-O. Like punk bands that legitimately are calling for anarchy. It's not a pose. They want an anarchic society. <laughs> anarcho punk begins to happen, right? So all this is going on. But punk begins to blow itself out and to splinter, all right? And in the wake of that, you get these subgenres, and you but you get people who have come out of the punk scene with the sort of ethos that punk was built on, all right? And punk was about DIY. Punk was about lo-fi. Punk looked at the garage bands of the 1960s playing very simple kinds of songs, right? But with energy, right? And with drive. So the punk songs were short tunes, very simply played. A complete opposite of the prog stuff that they were hearing or even the virtuosity, you know, in kind of a Led Zeppelin. It's like, throw that away. Go back to the garage sounds of the 60s, which was simple. And most of us can't play like Hendrix. And most of us can't play like Zeppelin anyhow. But we still want to play. And we still got stuff to say. Stuff that's a lot more useful than whatever the Rolling Stones are saying, man. All is not well here. And we want to talk about it. And so the punk music comes from this idea. And then there are people who come out of the punk movement who still appreciate that. And they appreciate the DIY concept, you know? Punk didn't want corporate help. <laughs> punk was mad at corporate bands like Zeppelin and the Stones. We don't want that. We'll do it ourselves. And so punk was very DIY. We'll make our own lo-fi kind of awful recordings and we'll distribute them ourselves. And we'll have underground clubs and we'll have underground magazines and we will build a culture of our own. And we'll make it smaller, and the connections will be real, you know? Punk begins to fall apart, but there are people who come out of that scene, who come out of that ethos, who also value DIY, who also still want to keep it simple, you know? Who also want to play songs that are kind of relatable. But some of them, inspired by punk, but not necessarily the garage bands of the 60s, but more the pop sounds of the 60s. All right, a little bit lighter little bit melodic, okay? And at the same time, you're beginning to get new sounds coming into music. These are electronic sounds, all right? Synthesizers, this kind of stuff. Electronic sounds, and people begin to experiment with this. You know, there's a certain point in time when punk and new wave were kind of considered the same thing. It was a catch-all term for underground music, but this is what begins to happen these new wave kind of bands start to pop up with synthesizer sounds and a less kind of hard edge inspired by 60s kind of pop music, okay? Still like the guitars, but they like the 60s pop, and they got these new kinds of sounds. And they begin to appear, and they begin to amass a following. These bands are, by and large, way less politically charged way less angry, way less confrontational, okay? Punk was such an angry phenomenon that it couldn't survive. <laughs> Nobody can blow that much anger for that long. It begins to splinter after like four years into all these offshoots. And you got the beach punks versus the hardcore punks down in California, you know? And it begins to splinter and factionalize and come apart. But these, one of the offshoots is these bands playing this kind of synth pop stuff inspired by the punk ethic. But what are you going to do with these bands? They begin to appear, but you can't call them punk. So you've got Blondie and you've got Talking Heads coming out of the kind of CBGB scene, right? Mid to late 70s playing cool music, but it's all been kind of wrapped up in this punk bubble. Can't call it that. <laughs> and the reason we can't call it punk music is because particularly in Britain, 
Punk music is a crisis, man. <laughs> in the States, somewhat different, but in the Britain, punk music was an uprising. It was, I've seen it described, as a moral crisis. These kids are nuts! And they're tearing down our institutions, and they're tearing down our traditions that serve us just great, but are not serving them. It was a cultural crisis. So if you're a new band emerging out of the wake of the punk movement, you don't really want to be associated with that. <laughs> it's like, we can't really build a following. You know, we can't get on the radio. Punk bands probably didn't want to be on the radio, but these new bands did. They wanted to have careers. We can't do that if we're punk. Not right now. Way, way, way too much tar on that brush. We need a new name for this music. And so they began to call it. It separated and adopted the term new wave. And it was actually inspired by the new wave of cinema coming out of France. So it had like arty and modern kind of overtones to it, right? And the music was a little more innocuous. <laughs> so you begin to have bands like The Police and The Pretenders and Human League and Culture Club and Spandau Ballet and Tears for Fears. They begin to emerge in England from the rubble of punk. And they call this stuff New Wave to dissociate it from punk. And these bands together begin to form what they call the Second British Invasion. And they begin to kind of flood the United States with this music because what was going on in the States was disco was playing itself out. The hard rock stuff was even beginning to play itself out a little bit. There was nothing really happening that people could sink their teeth in, but they were really jumping on this new sound coming out of Britain. And so we have the second British invasion of these new wave bands, all right? And then something very, very important happens that ratchets that up just a bit, kids. When in 1981, a little television network called MTV goes live on the airwaves. And nobody in America is making videos worth showing, but all these new wave bands coming out of Britain are. And so MTV is saturated with new wave from Britain. And a couple years later, the music gets another burst. This is really interesting. The music gets another burst and finds you know, a real supporter and a booster in the person of John Hughes. John Hughes, legendary film director, whose 80s teen movies and comedies were enormously popular, John Hughes loved the new wave music. And so you're watching movies like The Breakfast Club or Pretty in Pink, you know, any of that stuff, and you'll find music by Simple Minds. And you'll find music by Divinals and Spandau Ballet and Wham and the Thompson Twins and New Order and Echo and the Bunnymen. And it goes on and on and on and on. These hugely popular movies are sharing this music with the kids. And the songs are becoming the emotional touch points for an audience of teenagers who love those movies. So there's this explosion of new wave music happening all over the place for some of those reasons. But if you dial it back, if you step back just a little bit to 1978, most of it's coming out of Britain. Okay, this is where this is happening. But somewhere at the crossroads of 70s guitar rock and punk ethic and these new electronic sounds is a band called The Cars. And The Cars release in 1978 their debut album called The Cars. And it's absolutely unbelievable. I had not looked deeply into the first Cars record, okay? But get a load of this, all right? The first three songs on the first Cars record. Good Times Roll, My Best Friend's Girl, and Just What I Needed. Have there been three album openers in a row with that kind of legacy and that kind of impact ever on anybody's record? 
Let the good times roll. Followed by my best friend's girlfriend. Followed by just what I needed. I mean, those are three. We look back on it now from our perch 40 years later. And it's like, those songs are legend. Those songs are freaking legend. All of them. And we all know them. Even if you've never listened to a, if you've never owned a Cars record, you know all of those songs, man. And then you flip over to side B. This is a nine song record. You flip over and you get, you're all I've got tonight. Remember that one? And Bye Bye Love, you know Bye Bye Love, even though you don't know you do. You do. You know Bye Bye Love. And then, all right, hold on to your hats. All you dudes who grew up in the 80s. <laughs> because the song Moving in Stereo comes next. Where do we know Moving in Stereo from, kids? Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Phoebe Cates climbing out of the pool in that fantasy sequence. Opening up her top, wrapping her arms around Judge Reinhold. That's Moving in Stereo by the Cars from this record. And then the last song, All Mixed Up. You take this record as nine cuts. Holy crap, man. That is one of the great debut records of all freaking time. There is no question about it, man. And it's at the forefront. You know, the cars get attached to the new wave movement. But if you listen to any of those songs, particularly the first three, you can hear the Ramones happening there. You can hear those simple kind of punk Guitar arrangements, guitar sounds even, particularly on this first Cars record. It's really, really interesting. And you have an assignment this week, kids, all right? As listeners to the show, just go, go on YouTube, go on Spotify. If you have it on vinyl, God bless you, sir. Go and listen to the first Cars record. You know, it's like not even 40 minutes long, I don't think. You will not regret it. Go and listen to that record front to back, and you will marvel at how many massive freaking songs are on it. This is the beginning of new wave music, and the cars are at the forefront, man. And it's very easy to look back. It's very easy to have retrospect on this and think, man, Rick Ocasek was looking around like, I hate this music, I hate that music. Let's pull synthesizers in, and let's create this new sound. I don't think he was. <laughs> I don't think most of the bands that get pegged with movements. I don't think they were intending to do any of that. I think they were just playing music that they liked. And it's the historians who apply the cultural significance to it. So I don't think Rick Ocasek was trying to launch new wave in America. I think he was just writing songs that he liked and they played them. And we look back 40 years later, like legend. <laughs> and that's just one record. You know, you pull up any sort of this is the Cars or the Cars Greatest Hits kind of list. You get all those songs I just mentioned and you get Drive. Drive is probably my favorite song by the Cars. Who's going to drive you home? You know that one. And you get You Might Think, which was a massive song. Not as big as Drive, actually, according to the charts, but massive. And you get Let's Go and you get Touch and Go and you get Magic. Uh-oh, it's magic. You know all of these songs. You might not even know they're the Cars, but you're like, you know that one. And so then you put on this list of Cars' greatest songs, and you just marvel. It just goes on and on and on forever. And you know them all. That's the amazing part. Even if you don't know it's the Cars, you know those songs. And so I don't think we're giving the Cars enough cred. I don't think we're giving the Cars enough respect. I don't think we're giving the Cars enough attention for being a freaking legendary band. Not just for the music, but for being on the forefront of a movement. The freaking Cars, man. And Ken the Zen and I are just talking about this on the way home. And then I dig in. And then it leads you into this idea of new wave. And it leads you, leads you back to the punk movement. And it's just cool how it all ties together, man. And I guess that's kind of a superficial history of New Wave and the punk movement. And there's stuff I forgot, but hey, you know, we do the best we can. And hey, we're at 45 minutes too, man. I'm trying to keep these shorter, so I got to blow out soon. 
but there's a few odds and ends I just gotta tie up real quick, all right? So last time around, we talked about the song Anthem for America by Crazy Licks, right? And that led us into a discussion of when did glam metal die? Crazy Licks thought 1993, and I thought much earlier than that. But what I didn't say in talking about that song is how much I love that freaking song. This song, Crazy Licks, Anthem for America. Straight up modern hair metal, glam metal, from Schweden. But it's a great song. You know, forget trying to turn that into some sort of podcast episode. If you just want to rock out for four minutes, great freaking song by Crazy Licks. It's on the John Huff podcast referenced on the podcast playlist if you want to hear it there. Or you can go online and watch the video. And there's some new music if you are, particularly if you are from that world. If when I was talking about the glam metal, you were excited about Tesla and sleaze rockers like L.A. Guns. Both of those bands have released new music in the past couple of weeks. Tesla released a new tune called Cold Blue Steel. And sounds like a Tesla song, man. Kind of drop tune, nice heavy riff, and super duper groovy. Tesla sounding really, really good these days. So go listen to Cold Blue Steel and a version of LA Guns. <laughs> a version of LA Guns, this one who has actually Tracy Guns and Phil Lewis in it, released a new tune called Knock Me Down. And guess what? Sounds like an LA Guns song, man. Still sounding like Hollywood sleaze rock. LA Guns is one of those bands that kind of in the 2000s, there were different iterations of it floating around <laughs> playing LA Guns. So there were two LA Guns going around. I saw one of them on a show somewhere, and I don't remember which one. And there were two Great Whites going around. And there were two Queens Rikes going around. This is what happens. Like these bands had really successful runs during the heyday. And then it fell apart and they went away. And then they started fighting with each other. And then they argued about who owns the name and who doesn't. And then they split off and they all called themselves whatever the band was, you know? So there could be 10 LA Guns is going around. I don't know. For me, LA Guns has got to have Tracy Guns in it as a starting point. And Phil Lewis helps too, right? So if you are a fan of sort of the classic LA Guns sound, knock me down. And hey, Grinder Blues, man! Just in time, because I talked about Grinder Blues a couple episodes back, Doug Pinnock and the Billman Brothers doing their drop-tuned blues. They finally dropped a new single. Their new record, El Dos, is coming out on September 24th, so that's an early birthday present for your boy. And they dropped the first single from that, and it's called Gotta Get Me Some of That. And you know what? It's really interesting because it is not so much a drop-tuned blues song. It's much more of a kind of 70s funk soul tune. Very, very, very cool. Gotta get me some of that by Grinder Blues. Doug Pinnock, 70 years old, still sounding great, man. This music works for his voice these days just perfectly. I'm going to sign off by saying, hey, thanks for listening. Thanks for supporting. You can find me mostly on the Instagram jw underscore huff and hey drop in on friday night for wine friday i don't know what we're going to talk about but it'll be something probably something to do with wine and you can find me on twitter although i'm not there much follow the facebook page of the john huff podcast because i do cross post there so if you're looking for news and updates you can find it there and i'm gonna ask you to smash that like button kids <laughs> just like saying that makes me feel young and hip but do subscribe to the show please wherever you listen please subscribe it helps me please leave a rating and review. I don't like begging for this stuff, but it helps, man. It helps me grow the show, and I do appreciate it. If you like what you're hearing and you're interested, please drop me a rating and review, preferably a positive one. And tell your friends, man. Share the episodes around. Give me the feedback. You know, write in if you think I'm way off about the punk thing or the new wave thing. I told you it was a superficial history. If you got favorite new wave bands you like, Got stuff you want me to dig into? Drop me a line. Let me know. You know, you can DM me on the gram. You can DM me on the Facebook. So, you know, let me know what you're into, what you're listening to these days. Gonna shut up shutting up. I do appreciate you listening. And hey, kids. 
I'll check you later. Oh, yeah. You might think it's hysterical what you put me through. Huh.